6. December 1974. The face that came in answer to Todd's insistent finger on the bell was haggard and yellowed. The hair, which had been lush in July, had now begun to recede from the bony brow. It looked lusterless and brittle. Dusander's body, thin to begin with, was now gaunt. Although Todd thought he was nowhere near as gaunt as the inmates who had once been delivered into his hands. Todd's left hand had been behind his back when Dusander came to the door. Now he brought it out and handed a wrapped package to Dusander. Merry Christmas, he yelled. Dusander had cringed from the box. Now he took it with no expression of pleasure or surprise. He handled it gingerly, as if it might contain explosive. Beyond the porch it was raining. It had been raining on and off for almost a week, and Todd had carried the box inside his coat. It was wrapped in gay foil and ribbon. What is it? Dusander asked without enthusiasm as they went to the kitchen. Open it and see. Todd took a can of Coke from his jacket pocket and put it on the red and white checked oilcloth that covered the kitchen table. Better pull down the shades, he said confidentially. Distrust immediately leaked onto Dusander's face. Oh, why? Well, you can never tell who's looking, Todd said, smiling. Isn't that how you got along all these years? By seeing the people who might be looking before they saw you? Dusander pulled down the kitchen shades. Then he poured himself a glass of bourbon. Then he pulled the bow off the package. Todd had wrapped it the way boys so often wrap Christmas packages, boys who have more important things on their minds, things like football and street hockey and the Friday night creature feature you'll watch with a friend who's sleeping over, the two of you wrapped in a blanket and crammed together on one end of the couch laughing. There were a lot of ragged corners, a lot of uneven seams, a lot of scotch tape. It spoke of impatience with such a womanly thing. Dusander was a little touched in spite of himself. And later, when the horror had receded a little, he thought, I should have known. It was a uniform, an SS uniform, complete with jackboots. He looked numbly from the contents of the box to its cardboard cover, Peter's Quality Costume Clothiers, at the same location since 1951. No, he said softly. I won't put it on. This is where it ends, boy. I'll die before I put it on. Remember what they did to Eichmann, Todd said solemnly. He was an old man, and he had no politics. Isn't that what you said? Besides, I saved the whole fall for it. It cost over eighty bucks with the boots thrown in. You didn't mind wearing it in 1944, either, not at all. You little bastard. Dusander raised one fist over his head. Todd didn't flinch at all. He stood his ground, eyes shining. Yeah, he said softly. Go ahead and touch me. You just touch me once. Dusander lowered the hand. His lips were quivering. You are a fiend from hell, he muttered. Put it on, Todd invited. Dusander's hands went to the tie of his robe and paused there. His eyes... Sheep-like and begging, looked into Todd's. Please, he said, I am an old man, no more. Todd shook his head slowly but firmly. His eyes were still shining. He liked it when Dusander begged, the way they must have begged him once, the inmates at Patton. Dusander let the robe fall to the floor and stood naked except for his slippers and his boxer shorts. His chest was sunken, his belly slightly bloated. His arms were scrawny, old man's arms. But the uniform, Todd thought, the uniform will make a difference. Slowly, Dusander took the tunic out of the box and began to put it on. Ten minutes later, he stood fully dressed in the SS uniform. The cap was slightly askew, the shoulders slumped, but still the death's head insignia stood out clearly. Dusander had a dark dignity, at least in Todd's eyes, that he had not possessed earlier. In spite of his slump, in spite of the cockeyed angle of his feet, Todd was pleased. For the first time, Dusander looked to Todd as Todd believed he should look, 
Older, yes, defeated, certainly, but in uniform again. Not an old man spinning away his sunset years watching Lawrence Welk on a cruddy black-and-white TV with tinfoil on the rabbit ears, but Kurt Dusander, the blood fiend of Patin. As for Dusander, he felt disgust, discomfort, and a mild, sneaking sense of relief. He partly despised this latter emotion, recognizing it as the truest indicator yet of the psychological domination the boy had established over him. He was the boy's prisoner, and every time he found he could live through yet another indignity, every time he felt that mild relief, the boy's power grew. And yet he was relieved. It was only cloth and buttons and snaps, and it was a sham. At that, the fly was a zipper. It should have been buttons. The marks of rank were wrong, the tailoring sloppy, the boots a cheap grade of imitation leather. It was only a trumpery uniform, after all. It wasn't exactly killing him, was it? No, it... Straighten your cap, Todd said loudly. Dusander blinked at him, startled. Straighten your cap, soldier! Dusander did so, unconsciously giving it that final, small, insolent twist that had been the trademark of his Oberleutnants. And sadly wrong as it was, this was an Oberleutnant's uniform. Get those feet together! He did so, bringing the heels together with a smart rap, doing the correct thing with hardly a thought, doing it as if the intervening years had slipped off along with his bathrobe. Achtung! He snapped to attention, and for a moment Todd was scared, really scared. He felt like the sorcerer's apprentice, who had brought the brooms to life, but who had not possessed enough wit to stop them once they got started. The old man, living in genteel poverty, was gone. Duzander was here. Then his fear was replaced by a tingling sense of power. About face! Dusander pivoted neatly, the bourbon forgotten, the torment of the last four months forgotten. He heard his heels click together again as he faced the grease-splattered stove. Beyond it he could see the dusty parade ground of the military academy where he had learned his soldier's trade. About face! He whirled again, this time not executing the order as well, losing his balance a little. Once it would have been ten demerits and the butt of a swagger stick in his belly, sending his breath out in a hot and agonized gust. Inwardly he smiled a little. The boy didn't know all the tricks. No, indeed. Now march, Todd cried. His eyes were hot, glowing. The iron went out of Dusander's shoulders. He slumped forward again. No, he said, please. March, 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 I said. With a strangled sound, Dusander began to goose-step across the faded linoleum of his kitchen floor. He right-faced to avoid the table, right-faced again as he approached the wall. His face was uptilted slightly, expressionless. His legs rammed out before him, then crashed down, making the cheap china rattle in the cabinet over the sink. His arms moved in short arcs. The image of the walking brooms recurred to Todd, and his fright recurred with it. It suddenly struck him that he didn't want Dusander to be enjoying any part of this, and that perhaps, just perhaps, he had wanted to make Dusander appear ludicrous even more than he had wanted to make him appear authentic. But somehow, despite the man's age and the cheap dime store furnishings of the kitchen, he didn't look ludicrous in the least. He looked frightening. For the first time, the corpses and the ditches and the crematorium seemed to take on their own reality for Todd. The photographs of the tangled arms and legs and torsos, fish belly white in the cold spring rains of Germany, were not something staged like a scene in a horror film, a pile of bodies created from department store dummies, say, to be picked up by the grips and prop men when the scene was done, but simply a real fact, stupendous and inexplicable and evil. For a moment, it seemed to him that he could smell the bland and slightly smoky odor of decomposition. Terror gathered him in. Stop, he shouted. Dusander continued to goose-step, his eyes blank and far away. His head had come up even more, pulling the scrawny chicken tendons of his throat tight, tilting his chin at an arrogant angle. His nose, blade-thin, jutted obscenely. Todd felt sweat in his armpits. Halt! he cried out. Dusander halted. Right foot forward, left coming up and then down beside the right with a single piston-like stamp. For a moment the cold lack of expression held on his face, robotic, mindless. And then it was replaced by confusion. Confusion was followed by defeat. He slumped.
Todd let out a silent breath of relief, and for a moment he was furious with himself. Who's in charge here anyway? Then his self-confidence flooded back in. I am, that's who, and he better not forget it. He began to smile again. Pretty good, but with a little practice I think you'll be a lot better. Dusander stood mute, panting, his head hanging. You can take it off now, Todd added generously and couldn't help wondering if he really wanted Dusander to put it on again. For a few seconds there...